final Monday mornings of our uh, unprecedented <laughs> Monday mornings Zoom series. Um, I want to thank you all for coming to all of these. And um, I want to thank the friends for uh, sponsoring this series. I would like to uh, introduce Barb Facto, who is our presenter today. And um, she'll be talking about Virginia Lee Burton. Um, and take it away, Barb. Thank you. So hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm here to talk to you about one of my favorite picture books, if not my favorite picture book, um, which is this, The Little House by Virginia Lee Burton. Uh, Virginia Lee Burton was a local writer. She uh, lived in the Lanesville section of Gloucester for um, her adult life. And she um, started out as an artist and a designer. I'll talk about her a lot, <laughs> you'll hear. But for right now, in case you are not familiar with uh, The Little House, I just wanna give you the Reader's Digest version. It was written in 1942, and it's about, you'll be surprised to hear, A Little House. So I'm gonna read you just the first couple pages, and then, um, and then <laughs> we'll talk about it. So once upon a time, there was a little house way out in the country. She was a pretty little house. She was strong and well-built. The man who built her so well said, this little house shall never be sold for gold or silver, and she will live to see our great-grandchildren's great-grandchildren living in her. The little house was very happy as she sat on the hill and watched the countryside around her. She watched the sun rise in the morning. She watched the sun set in the evening. Day followed day, each one a little different from the one before, but the little house stayed just the same. And um, we'll go into a little bit about what happened to the little house as soon as I get my screen share up. <laughs> so, um, let's see, share screen. And there we go. You should see a big sign that says the little house in Folly Cove, Virginia Lee Burton and creating community. So, um, now I just need to find my little, okay, so, um, before I begin, I need to tell you that there are 52 copies of The Little House in the Noble Network, and that doesn't even include the ebook version, so there's no excuse for you to not have read this book. Um, I feel like every house in America should have a copy, so you can buy one from Copper Dog downtown or the Bookshop of the Farms or really anywhere you buy fine books. Um, this is a picture of Virginia Lee Burton. She's the author, and that's her in her writing cottage, which will play a part in this talk. So the first section is the little house, the book itself. This is uh, the wall over my piano in my tiny little house downtown. And you can see that there are four pictures over it. Those pictures are the little house in spring, summer, fall and winter. I've had them hanging over my piano for 22 years because they make me happy and um, they're beautiful. So I am clearly somewhat obsessed with this book. So According to Andrea Pinckney, who is a children's book writer and publisher, um, well, The Little House came out in World War II, and she said it um, provided a sense of safety, a sense of solace and comfort, which was important at that time. And you can see how soothing the pictures are. Anita Sylvie, who is a educator on uh, children's books, put it this way. She, she pointed out uh, Burton's design background. She said, the little house is in the same spot in every illustration, but everything around her changes so much that you don't notice that Burton has changed the focal point of her design. And you can see that this is accurate throughout the seasons. There she sits. Now, all of a sudden, things are getting weird for the little house. There's, in, in Burton's design, that little circle where, where the little house is, that still remains harmonious, but there are um, more strident elements along the outside, according to Sylvie. Now, what happens is a little house gets built up and there's some big buildings. I feel your pain, little house. And it gets even bigger. With her, the way that she drew, there's so much movement around. Oh, look how sad she is. She's sad and lonely. Um, Lee Kingman, who was... Um, Burton's editor said, nothing is static in her books. There's dance on the page and you definitely get that feeling of movement. And here's some more movement. What's happened is the great, great granddaughter of the man who built the little house 
saw the house in the city, said, hey, wait a minute, I know that house. And she proceeded to move it. Now, this is a screenshot that I took. I like the way that it is sort of has the two pieces in it. And this is from the movie um, Virginia Lee Burton, A Sense of Place, of which there are eight copies in Noble. You should check that out too. And that was made by a local filmmaker. And it's I, I use that also um, as a, a big source for this talk. So um, as far as the sort of philosophy behind the little house, Susan Etheridge, a Smith College um, professor of children's literature says, the little house is possibly the first sociology text for children. It's Rachel Carson for children. It deals with the initial, uh, initial displacement as a theme and finding a new place in a world that's changing. Martha Oakes, who's a curator at the Cape Ann Museum put it beautifully, I think. She said, quote, it's a story about honoring the past, respecting the built world, and at the same time, the natural world. It's a story about the importance of living in harmony with nature and the restorative powers of peacefulness and beauty. It's also a story about second chances and the importance of family, home, and legacy, and about remaining useful and productive. And that is so much of what Virginia Lee Burton's life uh, was about. She very much um, was a homebody. This is a picture from her, her last book, which was uh, Life Story. And that's her home right there. It's um, in Folly Cove. This is an actual picture of it, another screenshot from A Sense of Place. And this house inspired the little house in that um, when she and her husband first bought the house, it was right up on 127. And they had two small children. And so they decided to move it. And they pushed it back uh, further into their property. You can see right here, um, this is the gate. The house still stands. It's still, um, people still live in it. As a matter of fact, I went there a few weeks ago to try to take a picture and kind of freaked out the new uh, owners. It was a mild case of trespassing. Um, but <laughs> I'd asked them if they would send a picture uh, of what the house looks like now, but it's, um, they didn't get back to me, but I understand. I, I, so I think I freaked him out. Anyway, so this is, you can see how far back there's a tiny little white speck back there, which you can see is the house. Um, there are uh, many ways in which the little house uh, has been put out or several ways that it's been put out in other uh, formats. These are two of them. Well, the first, the one over to the right is um, an early drawing for the little house. And that was, this is an angle that Burton didn't use in the, in the book itself. She firmed it up very much. The, um, the one with the, the digger there is from the Walt Disney short of the little house, which by all accounts, Virginia Lee Burton did not care for. So don't feel like you have to go watch that. Um, in 1954, the book was translated into Japanese by Momoko Ishii, and Burton traveled to Japan 10 years later, invited by the American Cultural Center in Tokyo, and Momoko Ishii um, hosted her there. She and the translator became very close, like sisters, according to her son, Eris. Um, to celebrate the 75th anniversary, Gallery A Quad um, in Tokyo created a beautiful collection of her work, including an incredibly detailed 3D version of the little house itself. And there I am in 2016, the Cape Ann Museum in Gloucester began communicating with AQUAD about hosting the exhibit themselves. And in November of 2018, they opened a scaled down version, which I had the pleasure of attending. I actually got in trouble. You can see there's a little access way over there to the left. And I attempted to go around and get a picture of the back of the house because I'd never seen the back of the house. It doesn't appear in the books. What is that house hiding? Um, I did not have time to get a picture before I was reprimanded. So I think there were two windows back there, but I can't be sure. So there were a lot of Burton's um, uh, papers there. There were uh, different uh, drawings that she'd done that you could look at. There's my friend Shilpa looking at something on the wall. And there's sort of a sideways angle of the house, but you can get some perspective of size there. So there's a wonderful catalog from this collection that also has uh, a fascinating interview with um, her son, Eris, as well as first person reminiscences of her Japan trip from Momoko Ishii, the translator, and Kyoko Matsuka, who was a young children's librarian at the time. And the two of them eventually established the Tokyo Children's Library. You can get a copy of this catalog for $5 at the Cape Ann Museum, which is reason enough to visit. It's um, the Cape Ann Museum was also a great resource for this talk and I highly recommend a visit. There are a couple of copies of this also with the Gloucester Public Library, but they are in the reference section. So you can't get them through interlibrary loan, but eventually you could look at them there as well. 
So um, as I said, the little house uh, has had has had feet. It's never been out of print, um, and it's been referenced. The, this is an article from the National Observer in 1967 which um, is about a house being moved that references the little house and they've got a little picture uh, from the book there. There's also a wonderful quote from Ann Tyler um, that I found in Barbara Ellman's book, uh, Virginia Lee Burton, A Life in Art, which is a tremendous book that I recommend. Um, and Ann Tyler talks about her lifelong fascination with the book. She says, quote, I've returned to the little house over and over, sinking into its, comfort, uh, its colorful, complicated pictures all through my childhood and adolescence and adulthood. First, my parents read it to me, then I read it to myself. I believe this book spoke to me about something I hadn't yet consciously considered, the passage of time. And it introduced me to the feeling of nostalgia, the realization of the losses that the passage of time can bring. And I think that that's beautifully put and, and also somewhat my feeling about the book. Okay, the next section is called Ginny. And <laughs> my husband said, are you sure you're spelling that right? But that is uh, Virginia Lee Burton's uh, nickname. When Burton met Momoko Ishii in Japan, she said, call me Ginny, all my friends do. And so even though Ginny and I only inhabited this planet together for just shy of three years after having researched this book, I consider her a friend. So I will be referring to her as Ginny from here on out. And here she is. This is the first image uh, from Barbara Ellman's book, Virginia Lee Burton, A Life in Art. Oh, forgot to mention, 12 copies in Noble. Take a look. So Virginia Lee Burton was born in Newton Center, Massachusetts on August 30th, 1909. This is her father, Alfred Burton, and he was, uh, he was born in Portland, Maine in 1878, and he was very adventurous. He studied to be an engineer, and he went on several expeditions, including one to Greenland with Admiral Perry in 1896. He um, was the first dean of MIT. He uh, married and had two sons with his first wife. Uh, one of them, Harold Burton, uh, ended up being mayor of Cleveland, Ohio for many years, which I found interesting. So Ginny's you know, paternal line was very sort of you know, cultured, successful. Now this is her mom. Lena Yates was born around 1879 in England. She wrote several books as uh, Lena Dahlkeith. She also used the names Juniper Green and eventually uh, Jean Dorge. She was a writer and she met the widowed Alfred on a walking trip to France in 1906 and married him shortly thereafter and they moved uh, back to Newton Center. So Ginny uh, had a happy childhood in Newton. She was involved in dance. Uh, her family barn was converted into a schoolhouse and her father always gave the kids books as gifts, which is where her interest in picture books began. She had a, another brother and sister. Are we leaving now? No. Um, because of Lena's health, she and the children moved to California, and in 1920, they settled in Carmel, California. It was a very bohemian, artsy place at the time, and Alfred joined the family when he retired from MIT, but the marriage didn't last. In 1924, when Ginny was 15 or so, her mother woke her up in the middle of the night and told her she was in charge of taking care of the family because uh, her mom was going to move in with a man 24 years her junior, and she never looked back. Her, uh, her second husband was also a former student of her first husband. So this is when uh, Lena, uh, Ginny's mom, took on the name Jean Dorge in a nod to Jean Joan of Arc and the River Dorge in France. She was a little pretentious. So her second husband died young, but before he did, he invented a rivet that was widely used during World War II. So while they were together, they were quite poor. But after his death, uh, Lena became quite wealthy. She became a patroness of the arts. In addition to continuing, her, to continuing her own artistic pursuits, she refused to sell her paintings. This is, a, this is one of them. Um, she, she said, I'm just a paintbrush for God. Okay, she was completely pretentious. Um, but that break with her mother definitely impacted Jenny. So at the time, you know, uh, her father felt unable to care for the children. And so they were sent to live with different families. Jenny uh, was fostered out during her high school years. And although she was deserted by her mother, she was never bitter about it. Her son said, this is a quote from him. My mother had a natural affinity for life. Bitterness had no role. I think she was determined not to visit on her children what had happened to her, a mother that abandoned her husband and family, children that were separated and uprooted. So no record seems to exist as to who she lived with, but she was involved in her high school. She was editor of the yearbook at Sonora High School, and she continued with studying dance and art 
she wanted to go to college. So when she graduated, uh, she went to San Francisco to continue uh, studying dance. She studied with Muriel Stewart, who had been a pupil of Anna Pavlova, and she studied art with Robert Hestwood. Now, her sister had gone east and gotten a contract as a dancer with the Vaudeville show. And she invited Jenny, who was uh, you know, quite a talented dancer, to come out. And Jenny had even signed a contract. But as she was headed out that way, her father broke his leg and needed help. So she went to Boston instead to help him out. Now, this sounds like a story of a young girl giving up her dreams to help her father, which is how it started out. But in Boston, she had a really uh, wonderful time. She began teaching art at the Burroughs Newsboys Foundation. She taught swimming at the YMCA, and she started doing sketches for the Boston Transcript when she was only 20. Um, she would go to a play, go to a show, and she would sketch. And then <laughs> by the next morning, those sketches were in the paper. Um, and she was quite well regarded, especially for uh, such a young age. She started taking sculpture and drawing classes from George Demetrios in the fall of 1930. George Demetrios will play a large role. He, um, he emigrated to the United States from Greece in 1911 when he was 15 years old and he worked as a shoeshine boy and he would sketch between customers. Well, he was spotted by an illustrator and painter, John Hybers, who was really impressed by his talent and got him a scholarship to the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. After that, he went to Paris and studied the, at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts and at the Sorbonne. And he, while traveling in France, he saw the cave paintings and he became convinced that drawing from life was the best way to capture the realism he wanted to convey in his work. That's according to Elliman. So this is a picture of him um, by Hybers who uh, discovered him. So that was when he was quite young. So Charles Grafley was his mentor. Here's a picture of Charles Grafley in a fountain that he designed for the Pan American uh, Expedition, <laughs> Exposition in Buffalo in 1901. Um, Grafley is important because he uh, was a mentor of George and when he passed away, he left George a, his studio in Folly Cove in the Lanesville section of Gloucester. And that's where George uh, had the summer classes for his school, the George Demetrios School of, of Drawing and Sculpture, which he opened in 1927. So this is where he met Ginny in, in the fall of 1930, and they were married by March. <laughs> they lived in Lincoln, Mass. for a little while, and that's where their um, first son was born. So according to Elman, the strength that they drew individually and together from the natural beauty of the area and their mutual belief in the inherent artistic ability of all individuals inspired the enthusiasm and devotion of countless pupils. And according to Harold Ball, who was the former president of the Cape Ann Museum, this is a quote, when things were rough on Cape Ann, the Demetriuses gave a lot of people a lot of pleasure and helped them find something of the pleasure of life inside themselves. And this is a huge, a huge philosophy in Jenny's entire life um, of making community, of finding uh, things inside you that, that everyone has access to. So this is her older son, Eris, and the, he's in front of the house. This is from... Um, uh, the film, A Sense of Place, he says, quote, she gave me a foundation of trust and joy upon which I based my life. To others, she's given the legacy of possibility and love and concern about what's around you and to make the best of whatever that may be. She could find wonder in just about everything, which ugh, that my kids would say that about me someday. Um, so she had two sons, uh, Eris and Mike. These are them. Uh, Eris is in the cap and then little Mike is the one in the overalls. And they uh, both uh, grew up and moved to California. Eris is currently still a sculptor. Uh, Mike passed away a few years ago, but he worked in entertainment and he built theme parks, which I think is a wonderful thing to do. Here's a couple more family pictures, uh, Ginny with the boys, and then a more formal picture with she and George. And that's uh, his nephew, Costa, uh, who spent a lot of time with the family and uh, the two of them. So Ginny's life was defined by a harmony between work and leisure. Um, she often combined both. They gardened, they, they had animals. They had this tape. So the cake there is a replica of their house. She would have been awesome at Pinterest. That's uh, Mike's birthday cake. Um, there was always music in the house. Ginny still danced. She studied dance and taught dance uh, you know, at different times in her life. Now notice that granite picnic table. It was made from local granite that was uh, rejected by its intended buyer because it had a little dark spot, but Ginny loved it because she said, it's the perfect table. You never need a cloth. And when you want to wash the table, all you have to do is turn a hose on it. 
So thanks to Google Maps, I found that <laughs> that table, you can see it down in the lower right corner. It's still there, visible from space. Well, not space, but certainly from Google Earth. Um, they, again, they, they had animals. They, uh, this picture is actually the dedication page that, of the boys and the, the goat and the dog. That's from uh, Barbara Elman's book. And I'm not sure if Ginny drew that. I couldn't find a notation either way, but I thought it was interesting that, you know, goats threw out. This is a picture from her final book, Life Story. You can even see those little tiny goats back there by the house. And if you notice, um, over to the left of the house, there's a tree with two swings on it. That tree is in so much of Ginny's work. It appears in the little house. These are some pictures uh, of hers that are at the Cape Ann Museum. You can see it there. You can see it um, on the screen and this other um, picture with the swings. Very consistently, uh, it appears. So it's uh, the kids are born, they're in Folly Cove, and the depression hits. And there's um, a couple of different ideas. Some sources say that Ginny began writing for children as a creative outlet combining art, design, and storytelling as an outgrowth of spending so much time with her children. But also, it was the heart of the depression and money was tight. Whatever the case, she uh, wrote her first book. It was called Jennifer Lint, and it was about a piece of dust. In her autobiographical sketch for Houghton Mifflin, which was her publisher throughout her career, she said, I and my friends thought it was very clever, but 13 publishers disagreed with us. And when I finally got the manuscript back and read it to Eris, age three and a half, he went to sleep before I could even finish it. That taught me a lesson. And from then on, I worked with and for my audience, my own children. I would tell them a story over and over, watching their reaction and adjusting to their interest or lack of interest. The same with the drawings. Children are very frank critics. So even though Jennifer Lent did not uh, get picked up, someone at Houghton Mifflin saw it, and she was hired in 1937 to illustrate the book Sad Faced Boy, which was by Harlem Renaissance writer Arna Bontemps. And she did that very quickly and very well. And shortly thereafter, her first book was published. Um, it was called Choo Choo, and it was her first book as both a writer and an illustrator. It also came out in 1937, and it's dedicated to Eris, her older son. And it was inspired by watching the engines at the Rockport station with her boys. It was also the first in her theme of um, anthropomorphized machinery uh, that's sort of in a world that's kind of passing them by a little. Now, certainly you're gonna recognize this one. This is Mike Mulligan, which is likely her most popular book, at least in the minds of children. Um, it was published in 1939, and it's the story of Marianne, a steam shovel who's considered old fashioned, and Mike Mulligan, who operates her. You probably know the story. It ends beautifully. Marianne proves her, proves her worth. Um, it was also a community effort. Many of the characters in here were modeled off of local citizens uh, from the surrounding area. Uh, Ginny's ideas of usefulness and community that were so prevalent in her life are illustrated here. And this one was dedicated to her mic and that picture looks just like, just like him. Uh, her next book was Calico the Wonder Horse. Now she wrote this as a response to her older son's love affair with comics, funnies, radio programs. She did not approve of comics from a design perspective. She wanted to make a good comic in the form of this book. It was originally published under the name Calico, the Saga of Stewie, Slinker. She'd wanted to call it Stinker, but the publisher thought that was undignified. But when it was republished later, they gave her her Stinker back. So you can, it's under uh, two different names. Um, according to Elman, this 1941 Western is her one book that deviates from her major theme of usefulness. Then she wrote a little, she did some illustrations for other people. She did uh, Fast Sooner Hound, another book by Arna Bontemps, and then Don Coyote by Lee Peck. And she also wrote the Little House, which we looked at earlier. And this was her, um, this was her uh, dedication to Dorji. And you can see the little G inside the D. Uh, that's to her husband, George, with daisies all around, which is her favorite flower. Um, now, at this point, she also developed a group called the Folly Cove Designers. And I will get to that in a little bit. But I want to keep talking about her books because I'm a librarian and a completionist. But I did want to put this one up because it does denote, uh, this is Dance of the Hours. This is one of hers. And she, um, this was a textile uh, design and she did design textiles under her name, Virginia Lee Demetrios. Everything else was under Burton. So we'll get back to this in a minute. So Katie in the Big Snow, this was, 
this was number one with a bullet at my house because my little sister's name was Katie. In 1943, uh, she published Katie in the Big Snow, which set uh, which, was, which was set firmly in her philosophy of comfort in the endurance and reliability of the tried and true, according to Elman. Um, Katie was a, a uh, plow that did her job, basically. Um, I was really interested in all the dedications to her books. And this one, um, I finally found in the Quad 4 catalog, the dedication, it's to John from Ginny. And the John in this apparently is the um, someone from the Department of Road Management in the city of Gloucester. Now you'll see there's a there's a map from the book over in the upper right, and that map is very similar to the map here on the Gloucester Harbor Walk. Geopolis, which was the town that Katie cleaned up, is is Gloucester in the book, and Gloucester is pretty darn proud of it. There's a um, there's in the in the um, in the Harbor Walk there's a notation about Katie there. So the Song of Robin Hood, the saga of the Song of Robin Hood began in 1941. Ginny spent two years just developing a medium and technique for the illustrations. This was when she was working with Folly Cove designers and there's very much uh, that feel to her work. Uh, she was hired to do the illustrations for Anne Malcolmson's Song of Robin Hood and she spent four years creating individual illustrations for over 400 verses for this book. Each one of those little um, this little things was unique. Um, the book finally came out in 1947 and can surely be called Ginny's artistic tour de force, according to Maisei Miyagi, who um, appears to be Japan's answer to Barbara Elliman. She wrote that in an essay for the Aquat exhibit catalog. And once again, there's that tree. Now, this was kind of a departure. In 1939, she illustrated a version of The Emperor's New Clothes, and it, you know, the book is listed under Hans Christian Andersen, who wrote the story, but she did the illustrations and they stylistically seem very different um, in, in their form, but there's still that feeling of movement to the illustrations. Um, Ginny had reconciled with her mother by the 50s and would visit California. And in 1952, she published Maybell the Cable Car, which is about, you guessed it, a cable car being pushed out by new technology. The dedication for this book, uh, she dedicated it to Friedel Klossmann, although she's referred to as Mrs. Hans Klossmann. And uh, Friedel was instrumental in saving the cable cars in San Francisco when they were considered too old fashioned in 1937. So uh, when asked what she liked best about the process, Ginny said, quote, research mainly. I love research because I have so much fun doing it. By the time I was satisfied with my sketches, I could operate a cable car. Children have an avid appetite for knowledge. They like to learn, provided that the subject matter is presented to them in an entertaining way, which I wholeheartedly uh, agree with. So her last book was called Life Story. It was eight years in the making. It told the story of our planet. She did much of her research in geology, paleontology, paleobiology, and archaeology at the Museum of Natural History in New York. And she set the stage and gave the history of the world and then gradually narrowed her focus to the history of her home. And you can see in that picture, um, she's over there in the front left corner painting, painting her house. Um, so she tested her stories on kids and she was very fond of children, uh, very warm. And uh, one of her boys said, uh, as my mother wrote Mike Mulligan, she read portions to me and my brother and a handful of other neighborhood children to test it out. If we started to fidget around, she'd say it's back to the drawing board. She knew she had the right text when the kids were attentive until the end. So this is Lee Kingman Natty. Um, Lee was her editor. Uh, at, at um, Houghton Mifflin. And when she came to Lanesville to work with Ginny on Katie and the Big Snow, she was so captivated that she never left. <laughs> she married a local boy, Robert Natty. Um, and during World War II, when he was away, they had an epistolary romance, which is my favorite kind. And she uh, ended up becoming a very prolific producer in the Folly Cove design group. She also, and I did not know this until I began researching this, uh, she wrote one of my favorite books from when I was a teenager, Break a Leg, Betsy Maybe, which um, I, Lee uh, passed away this spring. And I was very sorry to hear that. I would have liked to have had a talk to her, but she and Ginny were very close friends and she was one of the Folly Cove designers. So of the Folly Cove designers, um, there's an article from Atlas Obscura, The Unlikely Story of the Folly Cove Guild. Uh, and there's a quote from it that I love. It said, thus began the Folly Cove designers, a ragtag group of locals united by their desire to fill their lives and their minds with a particular form of well thought out beauty. So this is a, is a, um, 
one of the uh, hand-drawn invitation to their first opening. Um, you can see the barn there. That was a barn that um, was right down the street from the Demetrios's. There's a group of the designers in front. Um, did I? Nope. Okay. So Lee Steele, who I believe is the last living member of the designers, said that uh, Ginny had an excellent sense of discipline. Um, they they designed in the arts and crafts style. There's uh, a picture of it later in the in the designer's career. This is what it looks like right now. Barn's still there. I believe it's a, a private home now. And I, during my time of wandering around Gloucester, um, you know, sort of just going into people's yards and such, uh, I took this picture at the end of the former Demetrios driveway and you can see the barn right in the center. So it was quite close to the house. And there it is uh, from the street view on Google Maps. So uh, in 19, the way it begun was, was thusly. In 1938, local violin teacher, Ano Clark asked Jenny to give her design lessons in exchange for teaching Eris how to play the violin. So Jenny said, yes, that's a great idea. Well, then more and more, uh, mostly women from the neighborhood became interested and joined. And eventually the Folly Cove designers became quite an enterprise. So Ginny believed, according to her son, that everyone had a piece of the God in them. Everyone had the ability to create art. She insisted that her designers work from their lives and study not photographs, but things from their own lives. She had them draw the image over and over again until it could be fashioned with complete authority. And that's um, according to Elman. So even though she was quite the taskmaster, uh, Ginny said, there are no shortcuts in learning design. It's a slow, hard climb and you never reach the top. The more you learn, the more there is to learn. Uh, nonetheless, she created this uh, diploma for the Folly Cove designers that illustrated their process and rewarded their hard work. And you can see the print and the, the um, table that it was made from at the, um, at the uh, good Lord, KPN Museum. <laughs> and then finally, um, so in the 30 years, years that the Folly Cove designers were working, they never uh, resorted to mass producing their work. They were offered many times, they were quite well regarded, but they really wanted hand created work. So the items that they did make are now quite valuable. This is one of my favorites. It's Ginny's piece called Reducing, excuse me, and it um, recently sold for nearly $3,000. So if you have one of these Folly Cove designs in your possession, be careful with it. <laughs> um, so here are George and Ginny, uh, after uh, their children were grown, they stayed involved in both their community and their art. Here's some of their pieces. Um, George's is on the right, that's called sauna. And Ginny's on the left is called three-part carved panel. Shouldn't put a ton of effort into that name, I'm just saying. Um, but they are both um, at the KPM Museum. And Ginny's piece, there's a similar piece that you'll see. Uh, we have another picture of her in her, in her writing studio that uh, is very similar to that. So this is a sculpture um, George created. It's in the courtyard of the, um, the KPM Museum. You don't even have to pay to see it. You can just walk in. Um, and I thought when I saw it that the face looked somewhat like Ginny. And so I wrote to the museum to see if she had, if they knew if she had modeled for it. So according to Leon Doucette, um, who works, um, who's one of the um, curators there, he says, quote, I agree that it bears a strong resemblance to Virginia and is reminiscent of the posthumous Ginny Goes to Heaven. I'm not seeing anything in her files confirming that it's a portrait of her, but they were both made right around the time she died in 1968. The fountain was originally titled Glee, but was later changed to Spring. So Ginny continued with music, design, writing, even as she became ill. So she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And according to Elman, she saw illness as weakness. Her, her Yankee constitution did not care for it. She soothed herself by walking in the woods, uh, sitting on a rock in Folly Cove near her home. She died on October 15th, 1968, and her ashes were spread around the acreage of her home. So this is a statue that George created. It's called Ginny Goes to Heaven. And it's beautiful. It's just her throwing her arms back and just then going. Um, so I, Barbara Elliman, whose book I have talked about about a thousand times in this talk, um, I had wanted to write to her and then I was looking for information on the internet and I found her phone number and thought, what the heck? <laughs> so I called her and she was lovely and we chatted for like 20 minutes. And she told me that when she was researching this book, she and her husband um, went out to California to visit with Eris and he had the statue in his basement. And he said, you know, this should really be outside. And so Barbara's husband helped Eris carry the statue outside. And I thought, 
I want to make a clever metaphor about her husband carrying the statue out and Barbara's work, uh, Barbara's work bringing Ginny's work to light. But I was overwhelmed by the <laughs> inability to do the metaphor. But I just thought that it was really, um, you know, a wonderful picture and really spoke to Ginny's joy at life, even at the end. All right. The last section is called community. How Ginny's sort of, um, how her work in life had gone on beyond her passing. So before I get into that, these two guys, these are my nephews. There's Johnny and Drew. These are old pictures. They're, you know, grownish now, but it's my theory that 35 years after I pass, they are going to be thinking like, who, Barb, Barb, who's that loud woman that used to come at Thanksgiving? They are not going to be keeping my legacy alive. Should I have one to keep alive? This, however, this is Sandy Burton, and he's Ginny's nephew. She was his godmother, his aunt. He considered her a second mother. He said that she um, was a huge driving force in his young life, and he looked at both her life and her books as roadmaps to teach him about the world. You'll see that sign behind him, and that is the Virginia Lee Burton Writing Cottage carrying on her legacy of reading, writing, and the arts. And it's a fascinating story. So here's Ginny and her writing college. And you can see that, that um, wood carving behind her that was similar to the one at the museum. Um, so Ginny and George brought land way out at the end of Folly Cove Point in 1963. And with the year, they put up a prefab writing cottage that they got from the building center in Gloucester. And that's where she would go to work. So in, uh, in the movie, A Sense of Place, Lee Natty uh, said, even she, as close as, as she and Ginny were um, as friends, she never even had been in the writing cottage. That was where Ginny went for, to isolate herself to work. Um, there were no neighbors, no telephone. It was just her and her work. So there's a picture of it, um, I think 2003. I, so my friend Carol and I did a little uh, trespassing. We went up the private road and Carol lives there. So she said, oh, I can get away with it, don't worry. But we went up and this is the spot apparently where, uh, according to Carol, where the cottage had stood and it's now somebody's lawn, um, but it's beautiful. I did a, I timed the walk and it took about 10 minutes to get from the base of Jenny's driveway up to the cottage. So it was fairly close, but the sense of isolation as you went from one, you know, um, from the busyness of 127 all the way up to here was a, a huge change. So this is a, um, a pulled back view a little bit of the spot and you can see Halibut Point over there across the water. And this, this was amazing. Look at that tree. Doesn't it look familiar? And I really wonder if that was planted as an homage by the people who own the house now, or if that just happened by kismet. But either way, it made me so happy to see it. So the land that the that the house was on was sold by the Demetrius boys in 2003. And Sandy, their cousin said, make sure you ask the owner if we can save the cottage. But with everything going on in the sale, they didn't do that. So Sandy uh, sent a letter to the purchaser through a lawyer and the new owner said, yeah, eventually I'm gonna tear that down. I'll let you know, and, you know, you can, you can have the cottage itself. So Sandy, even though he was living in California at the time, kept an eye on it. And then he, every time he'd come out to visit, he would ask the crew leader, hey, is that, you know, is that coming down? Do you know anything about that? They went through three different crews and finally uh, he got the call. Yep, it's coming down. You got two weeks to get it. So he came out and in, in two weeks, this is the progression of, um, of what happened. So there's the cottage in 2003 and in 2009. And then um, what was the year on that? I didn't 2017 is when they unwrapped it. So he, this is right before it was taken down. And then in 2009, he wrapped it up. And I said, now, where did you, where did you, who'd you get to shrink wrap that? And he said, I did it myself. So it was originally a prefabricated structure. And um, it was, he kept it in his yard for 10 years. And then, um, Let's see. In 2017, he gifted it to the Lansville Community Center. And so it began to be restructured and refurbished with the help of a Community Preservation Act grant from the city of Gloucester, private donations and corporate donations from Doran Whittier of Newburyport, DMS Machine and Fabrication of Bar Vermont and the Gloucester Building, Gloucester Building Center. It was reconstructed and refurbished. And there's Sandy 
looking exhausted. <laughs> he had a local posse uh, of people who all came together uh, to, to put this back together. Now, due to copyright legalities, uh, Sandy said, they couldn't call it the little house, which is what he wanted to originally do. So they called it the writing cottage, the Virginia Lee Burton writing cottage. Ready for the big reveal? Isn't it cute? The cottage opened in October of 2018 as a children's literacy and creative center. And there's another closer view of it. Here's me in front of it. I got to visit it the same day I attended the AQUAD uh, exhibit at the Cape Ann Museum, hence the giant grin on my face. And here I am with my friends uh, and Sandy. There's Sandy over to the left and he showed us around. Um, there are a lot of features to it that I loved. Um, the door, I, for some reason, it shows better in this picture that sort of the, the, um, the size of it, it's so wide and it's just really, I don't know, it added a great feel to it. So it's, um, that's the back, the view towards the back and here's the view towards the front. And you can see that it, it um, that archway there, it used to be two rooms. When Ginny used it, um, it was two separate rooms, but they decided to open it up because of the purposes of the cottage and all of that wood around the bottom, that's all original and the floors as well are original. So they have copies of all her books there, uh, you know, sort of keeping the legacy alive. Um, I wanted to end with this quote, which is um, a, a screenshot from the film Life Story and this uh, from the uh, A Sense of Place rather. This is from her last book, A Life Story. And now it is your life story. And it is you who plays the leading role. The stage is set, the time is now, and the place is wherever you are. And I thought that that just really summed up uh, sort of her philosophy and her you know, way of inhabiting the earth, I guess. So um, the pr this presentation would not be possible without the following people. Um, Carol Kelly, who is my partner in crime with trespassing, and she um, introduced me to Sandy Burton. Sandy let me interview him a couple of times about the writing college, cottage. Barbara Elliman, who wrote um, A Life in Art, and Christine Lundberg, who created the film a sense of place, the Cape Ann Museum, particularly Leon Doucette, uh, who were very helpful with looking at things, uh, the Beverly Public Library for making this possible, and Jane Schur, my mommy, who read me those books when I was little. Now, um, if you wanna see uh, where I got the photographs and things like that, this little uh, tiny URL will take you there. And way down at the bottom is a, um, is a link that will allow you to look at the slideshow if you want. I had um, timed it hopefully to take 45 minutes and I'm just shy of that, but I also put in a bunch of other slides um, because people had asked about the Folly Cove designers. So in case I don't run out the clock, these are, I'm just gonna run through these pictures of the Folly Cove design uh, process so that you can see them. Um, and if you wanna go in more depth, there's a wonderful book that the Cape Ann Museum put out um, that you can access. So. This is the press that they used. Um, there was a quote, and I don't know from whom, but it was with a scrap of linoleum, you can make your own pretty things. Um, all of these pieces had a beginning, a middle and an end. These are, there's Ginny's tree. That's some of her work there. Um, this is uh, George's garden, which she created. This is by, you know, Natty, um, you know, sense of movement in it. So these, you can't see a lot of details, but this is basically just a quick run through of the Folly Cove design room at the Cape Ann Museum, which is wonderful. And I, the Cape Ann Museum is open. You need to make a reservation, but um, it's really worth it. Not, I mean, the, the Folly Cove designer stuff alone, but there are also um, a ton of really great local paintings. Here's some of Ginny's work. That's the, the diploma that she made. Some other pieces. Uh, those are some of her, um, the boards that she made. And then this book called Big Machines. I figure if I really have, you know, need to fill some time, but it's a picture book about Ginny and her boys. And uh, there's Folly Cove and Katie and Mike, oh, um, Mike and Marianne, um, the little house, and then all of them together. And, uh, so that's that. Let me stop sharing this. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions? And I'll just pop in that we can uh, monitor the chat and I'll look for people with ha hands raised or just unmute yourself and just ask away. Barb, it's Heather. I have to scoot. 
I actually played hooky from work to watch this. <laughs> it was fabulous. I just loved it. And I can't wait to go up to Gloucester and the Cape Ann Museum and poke around and, and go back and reread these childhood favorites. You did a fabulous job. So thank you so much. Oh, that means a lot coming from you, Heather. Thanks. That's Our famous writer, Heather Vogel Frederick. <laughs> Barb, this is Mary Smith. I taught first grade for a lot of years here at the Cove, the Cove School and at the Edwards School. I've contacted you a couple of times about various other things. I remember last year when you talked about all of your books that you loved as a child. Uh, it was just, it was great because I could feel the same way about a lot of them. Um, but I wanted to let you know that in teaching first grade, I used The Little House every single year. It was one of the absolute most favorite books of all of the kids. They would sit there, they would just be mesmerized with the story and watching the surroundings change from, you know, being way out in the country to being so closed up in the city. And we used that book as a basis to start a whole unit on communities whereby we, our goal was to figure out what communities really needed and wanted and how best to set them up. So these are six and seven year olds, but you would be amazed at the kind of things that they could do. And sort of our culminating project was we would do a mural that would extend along one whole wall of our classroom made from cut paper illustrations, whereby the kids had decided exactly what was needed in a community and where everything should be placed and how it should all be set up. And this was based at the very beginning on the little house. Oh, so oh, it's just oh, a oh. wonderful, wonderful book. And my own kids, I've been to the Cape Ann Museum several times. I saw those, that exhibit with the little house from Japan and everything. But my own kids loved those books when they were younger. I can remember my son, who is now 35, taking him to the Cape mm -hmm. Ann Museum years and years ago to see an exhibit on Mike Mulligan and the steam shovel and all of the, you know, mm -hmm. Katie and the big snow and everything. So you, you did a fabulous job. That was a great presentation and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks. This is Pete I'm loving these Johnson. questions. <laughs> This is Pete and Joan Johnson. Could you, a uh, great talk, and I echo that uh, compliment about your, how, the influence of those things on your kids. Could you repeat the link for us to your tiny oh, sure. URL? Yes. Thank you. Me, uh, oh, come on here. Let me escape from that. There we go. Yeah, I will paste it into the, um, I can paste it into the chat. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And that has the citations, and it also has a link to the um, to the presentation itself. Wonderful. Everyone. Is this going to be uh, available in the Cape Ann Museum? You should you should have a a little spot for you to run this through as people <laughs> visit. <laughs> they they uh, they do things you know every once in a while for this. I am going to send it to um, Sandy Burton who. Um, who was going to try to come today. I was like, I'm going to be a little nervous if you're there, Sandy. <laughs> but um, he wanted a link to it. So they may put it on the, uh, the Lanesville Community Center page when Great. it comes out. So they'll have access to it. And we'll post a recording to YouTube. And we can also, we can put the link to the presentation um, Super. up there too. Yeah. That'll be wonderful. Really want to share it to uh, many members of our family. Oh, thanks. Anyone else? Okay, it looks like we don't have any questions. So I'll just reiterate that we will have a recording up and we can um, put a link up to the presentation and the, the, the tiny URL in there. Um, and thank you everyone for coming to the Monday morning series and thank you for coming to this presentation and thank you Barb for um, the great presentation and um, I'll see you all next season and someday we'll see you in person. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you.